winning your everything. Here are your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything, number 108. This is the Friday, August 4th edition of the show. I'm Gary. I'm Chris. On today's show, we discuss Ole Miss possibilities for a very brief moment. Then we're telling the coaches poll exactly where they messed up. We bring on legendary college football voice and current Fox Sports play-by-play man, Tim Brando. We're bringing in ESPN College Game Day producer, Chris Felica, to talk about the 30th anniversary of Game Day, and we're going to discuss some odds and whatnot. Uh, how gambling got started on ESPN, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll close out with a look back at the 1997 college football season's ending and why we should appreciate the current setup. Because sometimes I don't know if we do. But first, let's do the rundown so you know how you can contact us. Check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. You can give us a like on Facebook. Follow us over there, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. You can follow us on Twitter, at winningcures. You can follow myself, at GaryWCE. You can follow me at Chris B. Giannini, C-H-R-S-B-G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. You can also email the show, winningcureseverything at gmail.com, and you can download, subscribe to, and review the podcast. iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, all your favorite podcast apps. Go download it, subscribe to it, and review it. Now, review it on all platforms, but here's the deal with iTunes. For every 25 five-star reviews with a with a sentence, and it doesn't have to be long, just something about, we love this show, this show's great, Gary and Chris are awesome, <laughs> something along those lines, knock that thing out. For every 25 of those that we get, we're going to donate 25 bucks to St. Jude and Le Bonner. So each one will be, so the first will be St. Jude, and then the next 25 will be Le Bonner, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the plan for now. Um, and we're at 17 right now. That's right. So we got to get eight more. You get eight more reviews, knock that thing out, help us out. Those reviews matter as far as ratings and, and whatnot on iTunes. From there, you can also get us on Local X Radio every Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. During the football season, that might change. But for now, Tuesday and Friday, 9 a.m., localxradio.com or your Local X app. Today's show is being brought to you by Kyle Seeger's Designs. If you need great, affordable web design for your company, business, or just personally, check out kyleseegers.com. He can handle all your favorite... uh, Oh, God, I just messed up the ad. (laughs) He can handle all of your web development needs. Sorry, Kyle. Including site building, maintenance, branding, and more. For more information, visit Kyle Seeger's Designs at kyleseegers.com. That, my friend, is the problem with live reads. Well, Kyle... It, it, good thing we know him well enough. Yeah, I think I think it's going to be fine. Um, all right, now first off, to kick this whole show off, because I am super excited. Tim Brando, Chris Felica, two guys in college football I've followed for a long time. Super pumped about that. We're going to get them in here in just a little bit. I want you and I to start off first because, you know, our website's gotten a lot of traffic. And it is a ton of Ole Miss and Mississippi State and it, all the other schools that are following Ole Miss's case and whatnot. They want to know what's going on. Ole Miss received their response from the NCAA on Friday, July 21st. Ross Bjork told reporters that next Monday on the 24th that it would be made available hopefully within a week or so. It is Friday, August 4th. It has not been released. It's been two weeks. What do you think is going on here? I don't know. He said a week or so. That's that's what's nice about vague terms. The or so is generally like the next a week. couple of days or something, you know. Like if you're gonna if it's gonna be two weeks, you say two weeks. They're just keeping it close to the vest, I'm sure. It, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking there's nothing good in there for Ole Miss, and they're still trying to figure out a way to spend it to their fans. You might be right. If it's positive, it comes out the next day. Oh, oh, I completely agree with that. I just don't know if I agree with trying to spin it to your fans a certain way. Man, just own it. Yeah. Right now, you're in so deep. This is what came out. This is it. Now, I do want to touch on some rumors and whatnot. I, I, I bring up the Ole Miss topic like usual. Um, it, there have been rumors abound lately that Hugh Freeze may turn a, uh, what, what do you call it, a switcheroo and open up to the NCAA about Ole Miss and certain boosters and whatnot, trying to maybe cut down on uh, – on some of the time that might be on his possible show cause penalty. 
I'm not figuring – I don't understand the Ole Miss strategy on this whole Houston nutcase. It, it's absolutely baffling to me. They're all over the place. They hand over some records to Mars, and then they want to charge him $25,000 because they want to redact them. Well, public records you can't redact, and now they're saying they're not going to give them to him because they're not public records. Actually, this was paid for by a private foundation instead of the school, and et cetera, et cetera. When Mars started digging through phone records and started putting in requests, I got really confused. Like, how in the world could the NCAA not already have every record of every phone call made from a university phone, right? Any phone that any school, uh, you know, business calls that were made to or from qualifies as a university phone if it is owned by the school or any affiliated third party. It didn't seem right when I heard all that that the NCAA had done their job. Now, what I'm figuring out is the phone that Mars requested records for is a quote-unquote burner. And burner phone does not have to be like one of the $20 phones from Walmart. It can be a personal cell phone. But it could just be a personal cell phone that was unreported to the NCAA. The school used it to fire him, but the NCAA did not even know that it existed until the school gave Mars the records. Which is going to show, like, all those records are going to show that Bjork and certain boosters contacted Freeze on that phone, which makes it subject to NCAA request, and it shows that the administration knew about it and didn't give it to the NCAA as part of their whole self-reporting and, uh, what did they say, exemplary cooperation. Like, that is an absolute lock for lack of institutional control. Absolutely. Forget the Leo Lewis, Kobe Jones stuff at State. Forget Rebel Rags. Forget proving whether or not there were payments by boosters to players. Like, here's the reason that Freeze might turn. The school screwed up by releasing those records. Yep. And it, and it's not because it cost Freeze his job. It's because Ole Miss didn't comply fully with the NCAA, and this could end up costing all of them for a long, long time. This is what is probably going to be the chopping block for Bjork. Yes. If if there wasn't one already, if there wasn't the ability for him to save his job through this, this could be what was – just ended that and this is all this is hypothetical yeah this is all i don't have this confirmed but this is what it looks like it's turning into you know it this was a phone that the ncaa didn't know about and that's not a good thing when you're talking about being compliant like they it doesn't seem very cooperative when you're not handing over everything so i don't we'll we'll hop off that oh by the way Ole Miss had uh Linebacker uh, Dietrich Bean Dukes and cornerback Ken Webster, two starters, uh, suspended for the Rebel season opener against South Alabama on September 2nd. They were arrested for charges of shoplifting. Now, I heard that they got caught shoplifting at Walmart. I don't know if that's true or not. But I saw that they were arrested. I didn't read into what the charges were. I, I heard it was shoplifting. They were trying to take stuff from Walmart. It doesn't say what they were trying to take. But I am, I'm, I'm a little confused. Like, why? Like, I, and and think about that. Can you imagine how much vindication Mississippi State fans would have if Ole Miss lost the season opener to South Alabama, exactly one year after Mississippi State lost the season opener to South Alabama? Like, good gracious. <laughs> that doesn't look good for the SEC. No, no, not at all. Now, all right, enough of that. Enough of that. The Amway Coaches Poll Top 25 was released on Thursday. Exactly four weeks prior to the first Thursday of college football action and a little less than four weeks before actual football action because that stuff starts on August 26th. Stanford and Rice in Sydney, Australia, where David Shaw wants to go see a kangaroo. Did you hear about that? I did not. He, he said the only thing he wants out of Australia is to see a kangaroo. I'm like, you're going to be in the biggest city in yeah, Australia. There, I don't like, think there are a whole lot of kangaroos in <laughs> Sydney. I mean, unless you go to like a, you can go to a zoo. Oh, yeah. I mean, you you could definitely go to a zoo. Uh, Alabama is ranked number one. That makes 10 straight years that Alabama has been number one at some point. The only reason I bring that up is because, dear God, like, I don't know that anybody's ever done that. Maybe Notre Dame back in the 40s. I don't know that anybody cares. That's a – I mean, you might be right. It's still a pretty impressive feat. It's pretty ridiculous. You're really good. You've been really good for a long time. Well, don't say you – I'm just talking, Alabama. period. Alabama's Alabama. good, and they've been good for a long time. Let, let me explain this to the listeners. I am an <laughs> Alabama fan. Chris is an LSU fan. That does not mean that we are biased 
in in any way when we discuss topics. Lies. If this had been Ohio State, I would still be talking about the topic. I am I am a homer. I'm not gonna hide. It. I'm not gonna <laughs> deny. It. I'm the only one that's not in denial. That's there is no denial here. What what have I got to? You know this is this is bull malarkey to keep it kid friendly. Let's uh let's jump into this USA Today top twenty five. Have right. you looked this thing over yet? Yep. All right. So I put out on Twitter before the thing got released. I said I think it would be Alabama, Ohio State, Florida State, USC, and Penn State. They surprised me. They put Clemson at number five and moved Penn State back to number six. Do you know what the lowest a defending national championships a defending national champion team has ever started the next season? Because I would bet five is pretty far down there. Uh, it depends on, like, if you lose. Because, like, Auburn, after Cam Newton, I think they were, like, number 10. Okay. You know? All right. So there's precedent for it. Yeah. I, I totally think this is – they're the defending national champs. Because they that's lo- all. they lost a lot. And, and I don't yeah. think people realize how good Watson was. If you just think another dude – and this guy's, I'm sure, a five-star stud, whatever – another guy is going to come in and replace what was probably the best quarterback in the history of the school and y'all just aren't going to miss a beat. You, I, Not I think you're crazy. Yeah. I think you're just dead wrong. So I, I was, I thought this was too high for Clemson as well, but I also think the pollsters are just saying they're the defending champs. Penn state at six, Washington, seven, Oklahoma, eight, Michigan, nine, Wisconsin, 10, Michigan starts, one place higher than where they finished last year, and they lost 17 starters. I like Michigan this year. I, this I is, know that you is, do, but like... Another year under Jim Harbaugh's belt, man, he's just going to make that team better. He just is. What, what do you think about Wisconsin? Like, it, it, Tell me this. The Big Ten has got four teams in the top ten, mm-hmm. and then nothing else. Like the, the, middle of that, the middle and the bottom of that conference are pretty bad. They are super top heavy. Like, is this just a, a matter of, like, these guys are going to rack up wins? I think, okay, I, first thing, I think they're super top heavy because those four, yeah, that's probably the best four in the country. I mean, you, you saw what happened with there's Ohio not another, State last there's year. There's not another conference that has four teams that strong. Okay. Yeah, but are they actually that strong, or was it just built on? I think so. I do, I do. I know I think, you love Michigan this and year, and I love Wisconsin. I think they're. I think both of those teams are better than Washington or Oklahoma. I just do. I think Washington's going to be really good, but I, I, think, I don't think. I think that, there's a chance Michigan could be better than Clemson. I know that I picked Washington to win the uh, the Pac-12 North. I think I may change that pick. I think I may go Stanford. Washington's going to be good. This is not a. I mean, this is not a knock on them. But you're talking about power, national rankings. Yeah, I like the top four of the Big Ten. I think there are some Big Ten teams that got left out of there. The, the only one that's really coming to mind that I'd like. I think Northwestern's going to be a top twenty-five team. I think they are too. I think Fitzgerald has done a great job there. Yeah, and, and I, they I, did I, they I even like, get a vote? I like that team a lot. So they're, they Northwestern got twenty five votes. Okay, so they so kind two, of just three, missed out three more than Memphis. So they are number thirty five. All right. So now that some of these that I just hey, here, let's get through the uh, the rest of it. Keep number eleven, through, number five, mistakes. Oklahoma State. Number twelve, LSU. Number thirteen, Auburn. Fourteen, Stanford. Fifteen, Georgia. First one that pops out. David Shaw at Stanford has only finished ranked lower than twelve one time. I think they're going to be a lot better this year. Yeah. Like they they went through some injuries and and some other mess last year, and it really messed with the offenses. I think they're going to be worlds better this year. They get Washington at home, they get USC early. Like I think they're going to be awesome. Yeah, I like I like Stanford a lot this year too. I think I think they should be up there. Oklahoma and Oklahoma State are both good. I'm not knocking either of them. I like Oklahoma State better than I like Oklahoma. We got to remember, Oklahoma is starting a rookie coach. But not only that, but it uh, along with Baker Mayfield, who else is coming back? Like Dee is gone. Yeah. Um, it, P Ryan is gone. Mixon is gone. Like, and yes, I understand that they have recruited better than like a lot of the Big Twelve teams. But have they recruited well enough to compete with like Ohio State? See, yeah, that's that's. We're putting them in the conversation with the big boys because they've always been one. 
But we had this conversation at the beginning yeah. of last year, too. Kirby Smart, I, I said Georgia's going to lose games that they should win because he's a first-year head coach, and he's going – I don't know what mistake it's going to be, but he's going to make a mistake somewhere along crucial points of games because he's never done it before. Yeah. And he's going to cost them games. If we just work under this assumption that the youngest coach in college football – gets his very first head coaching job, is just going to walk in and replace big game Bob and be the exact same as him, I think that's nuts. And the I, expectations are a little It's not a high. knock. You're going to say that LSU is under first-year coach Orgeron, who, yes, was a complete failure at Ole Miss 10 years ago, but this is his second time around. He's got the exact same pedigree coming in of talent. He's got the exact same situation. The difference is, is he's in the SEC, not the Big 12. He's 12th, and you've got a first-year coach that's barely in his 20s. Well, he's 32 or 30, Whatever. He's 32. the youngest coach in college football. Yeah. And and I'm not knocking the guy. I'm sure he's an unbelievable offense of mine. But if you think he's just going to walk in and not make mistakes that first-year coaches are going to make. Like you you're, said, you're schedule means a lot on this. All right, let's, uh, let's do – Five more. Uh, we got number 16, Florida, number 17, Louisville, number 18, Miami, number 19, Kansas State, number 20, West Virginia. Um, is Louisville maybe ranked a little too low? Louisville's definitely ranked too low. Now, you know me. I actually think Louisville yeah. has a chance. They're not the favorite. I think they have a chance to win the ACC. I'm kind of surprised that Kansas State at number 19. Like, they're always really solid and whatnot, I, and they've got a lot coming back. I just... You know, it, it, their schedule sets up a little, little weird. That's um, that's that looks right for me. Miami at eighteen, um, it, we don't know what they're going to be. You know, they could not be a top twenty-five team. They could be a top ten team. It just depends on what the new quarterback is, and their schedule sets up really nicely. Like they, I, I like they, Louisville and I like Miami. I mean, that's so, that's my ACC championship game. And you got them both at seventeen and eighteen. Yeah, uh, number twenty, West Virginia. I. You know, that's who I thought was going to drop off the most. That's right. Um, I do love their quarterback, Will Greer. Greer at Florida, like, it led them off to a 5-0 and start. He was awesome. And in um, in that offense. Dana Holbrook's system. Yeah. He, they're going to have points. They're going to put points up. Now, the defense lost everybody. Well, but the, the problem is in the Big 12, nobody really plays defense. So, you don't sure. have to worry about it. But that's how they won games last year. Like, that's the biggest thing. So it, it's. I'm well, curious. It's a, it's a new year, though. We're gonna learn a lot about them with uh, the number 22 team. Number 21 is South Florida. Number 22 Virginia Tech. Number 23 Texas. Uh, that's laughable. Number 24 Tennessee. Number 25 Utah. Virginia Tech at 22 when they lost the entire offense. Um, I mean, it's it just sucks having expectations. You know, and yes, they went ten and four last year, and Fuente is known as a good coach. This is Fuente's first real recruiting class that he has coming in. Yeah, and so we'll see if you are going to lose a bunch of players on that team with Fuente being the coach. I want it to be on the offensive side of the ball. Yes, because, because he will I be think, able to get them in there. Yeah, because he can fix that. No, tell he me, might not be able to fix it. He can really help it though. Tell me what you think um, about. Tell me what you think about Texas. Oh, Texas and Tennessee both together they they don't deserve in the top 25 they haven't done anything to show you their top 25 teams i agree i mean you look at how they both finished last year and here's the, all right so the the preseason top 25 we know is just a big farce anyway that's right, right. it's it's this it, this is a this is a, a you know popularity contest yeah but here's the thing texas one everybody loves tom herman i know and texas does have talent like there is talent there you know, they competed with some of the big boys over the last couple of years. It was the games against the smaller teams that they always ended up, you know, crapping out. It, if if Herman I, I, can get it turned around even a little bit, like at Stanford Steve, it, who does the uh, Behind the Bets podcast yeah. with uh, Chris Felica, who's coming mm-hmm. on later, Stanford Steve picked Texas to go in and beat USC in week three. Wow. That, that would shock me. I, Same. I, I think my problem with Texas is is we've talked about this a lot last year. They have administrative problems. They don't have stability in an administrative office. And I I mean it's kinda like in the pro world. Organizational organizations win. And and bad, bad organizations continue to be bad. 
I think until they make some massive changes in their athletic department, I don't know that I trust anybody being the head coach because I believed in Charlie Strong. Now, maybe maybe my belief was wrong. Maybe I put a lot of stock in Charlie, but I don't see Charlie and, and Herman being any different. They both learned under Urban Meyer. They both coach extremely hard, hold their players to insane physical standards. So, so it's not like you replaced – you know, a hard nosed tough guy with a player's coach. Yeah. You just replaced the the defensive guy with an offensive guy. But yeah. at the end of the day, they they kind of have the same foundation. Yeah, we it, absolutely. And then Tennessee, I though you cannot you cannot finish the season the way they finished the season and tell me they're gonna walk into a new year. With a new quarterback, with, with new the, running backs, yeah. new everything. That's right. And new defense. Like they lost Derek Barnett. They lost Jalen Hurd or and yeah, Jalen Hurd the transferred wor- in the yes, middle. The uh, worst, Josh Dobbs. That's it. Well, and the worst thing that could happen is Butch Jones starting the season on the hot seat. Yeah. Because I don't think I don't think he's a great coach to begin with, but I definitely don't think with the pressure of having your job being loomed over you, yeah. I don't think that that's gonna make him be better i do agree i do agree all right uh to wrap this up part of me does wonder like is college football just not very good right now because here are the other receiving votes washington state colorado tcu who we think is going to be a top 25 team yep. boise state notre dame which what yep. has notre dame shown that's a name uh texas a m pittsburgh north carolina state oregon northwestern Nebraska, Memphis, like I think Memphis is going to be great. Uh, Arkansas, Mississippi State, San Diego State, Appalachian State, BYU, Georgia State, you know, whatever. Yeah. Like, are any of these people that you would like bet your bank account on? Well, it depends on what you're talking about. Depends on what's in your bank account. Well, yeah, that, that's that's an important <laughs> variable as well. But are we talking about to make the top twenty-five? Yeah, to win yeah, the dude. national championship? No. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying. Like, what conversation are we having here? Like, there's probably only, like, six or seven teams that could make the playoff. This but year. Isn't, isn't it that way every year? I mean, how is this year any different than the last five? No, no, I get, you're right. I think there, before the season starts, about 12 teams that feel like we got a legit shot. No, I think I think you're And then after about right. week three to five, it it breaks down to about six teams have a legit chance. Yeah. Yeah, you are. The number gets cut in half. You are 100% right. I don't don't know that college football is any different than it's always been. It's one of the reasons why the last 10, 15 years I have have been pushed more and more to the NFL is just because, you know, you you have teams that go from worst to first on a regular basis. Yeah, a lot of it has to do with schedule and and all that. Yeah, but you still – see, I I don't know that – the NFL has nothing to do with schedule. I mean, Uh, Man, Miami last year was – all schedule. Them making the playoffs last year was all schedule. I don't know. All of it. 100%. We'll, we'll all, break down some NFL stuff All those eventually. teams are good. All those players live in big houses. That's true. You're all right. of them. You're right. Even those quote-unquote garbage teams, they're still real good. Yeah, the Browns could still have beaten Alabama and Clemson last year. Oh, well. 100%. Yeah, you combine both of those teams to make a super team, and the Browns beat them by that's, 50. You see, that's what's nuts. Is that, you know, the idiots, Nobody, the idiots that talk about that, like, could Alabama beat the Browns this yeah, year? Like, no. No. That's crazy. They never could. This no will way. never, ever be a thing because, like, you have got the best of the best playing in the NFL. That's right. Period. That's right. The worst pass rusher on the worst defense – the Indianapolis Colts have to have one of the worst defenses I've ever seen in my life. The worst pass rusher on their team could blow through any offensive line you could put together in college. Exactly. It's just a different game. It's different. Like, they have more time to work out. All that comes to ah, blah. We, we're going long. And we got to get Tim Brando in here. So, speaking of, next up on Winning Cures Everything, we bring in the myth, the legend, Tim Brando. From Fox Sports and FS1, play-by-play guy for uh, college football and college basketball. Ooh, I'm looking forward to this one. All right, coming up next on Winning Cures Everything on Local X. This is Gary Seegers from Winning Cures Everything, and I know you're looking for new gear for college football season. If that's the case, check out the new online store at winningcureseverything.com. We've got new WCE shirts in all sizes with all your favorite SEC colors. Just click on the store tab at winningcureseverything.com. 
Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris on Local X. Right now, we want to welcome in a college football and basketball broadcasting legend. He was the first host of ESPN's College Game Day. He hosted College Football Today and at the half for CBS's SEC Game of the Week broadcast for 18 years. He currently hosts Football Saturdays in the South for Raycom Sports. They've won 12 Emmys in 14 seasons. And he's calling games for FS1 and Fox Sports this fall, who just added Big Ten football to the schedule. Now, he's one of the most recognizable voices in all of college football and basketball. He is Tim Brando. Mr. Brando, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Wow, you guys uh, read that just as I wrote it. Wonderful. (laughs) Good to be with both of you. Absolutely. (laughs) Now, this is your first time on the show. And while we do want to get into the upcoming season and whatnot, I do want to get into some of your background just a little bit. Now, there's obviously a thousand things. There's a thousand things that we could ask you. But I want to touch on this first. Hey, can you give me an idea of when you knew that you wanted to call play-by-play for games and, and also be a studio host? Like, what made you really fall in love with sports? I don't know that I ever thought about being a studio host. My generation, uh, to put it in perspective for you, okay, uh, as, as a child of uh, the 60s, uh, there was no NFL today. I mean, Brent Musburger hadn't even started that show. And there was certainly no cable television. So, you know, your your introduction to sports was watching the games. The games were the thing. Uh, And Kurt Gowdy was doing the World Series, the Super Bowl, and the Final Four all at the same time on one network in uh, in the 60s and 70s. And the Final Four only went on (laughs) national television. Uh, after the Houston UCLA game at Hoffa, that, that, that Roy Hoffines put together at the Astrodome in 1968, after the regular season game, with what at the time was the largest crowd in the history of college basketball, for Elvin Hayes and then Lou Alcindor, later Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and I was 12 years old then. So uh, those guys, Gowdy being the premier voice, there were others, uh, a lot of others, Ray Scott. Um, no question, Jim Simpson, who I later would work with at ESPN, he was uh, really the voice and face of, of ESPN uh, in its uh, earliest days. Uh, those guys were my mentors. Um, I, I'm, I'm leaving out some, I know. I mean, um, uh, Lindsey Lindsay Nelson was a great one. Uh, I mean, a tremendous one. And I, I really covet uh, back in 2014, I was the recipient of the Lindsey Nelson Award uh, that's given out by the Knoxville uh, quarterback club i think musburger got it a year ago and it's a, a, a real honor i mean to be in that in that uh, number to, to, to be a past recipient of that so we didn't have studio shows it was about being at the games the studio thing evolves that's something that um by the time i got uh to, to espn and started working for them in 1985 the, the studio thing evolved, and it really began with the NFL Today with Brent Musburger. There, there were shows like, for instance, in college football, the Prudential College Scoreboard with Merle Harmon and Bud Palmer, later Jim Lampley did it. There were shows like that, but they were always centered around scores and highlights, and that was about it. There was no produced, hour-long studio show where you did features and you had personalities and that's why College Game Day was such a novel concept at the time. Uh, and when I became, um, uh, when I left Baton Rouge and went to uh, Bristol, I really wanted to do games, but they, they said, hey, if you want to be a full-timer, you want to be a staffer, uh, you need to come up here and, and anchor for us some, because we, we know you can do that too. And there's nothing, I think probably more than, uh, for longevity's sake, The greatest asset uh, a young announcer can have is versatility, Uh, the ability to do uh, several different things, wear a number of different hats. Uh, And I was able to do that, and uh, the then boss that I had that that, uh, took my career from a play-by-play man just out there doing uh, games uh, here, there, and yon, whether it was in the Metro Conference or the Southwest Conference then or the Big 8 or the SEC, to, you know, this idea of having a, an hour-long pregame show for college football, it had never happened. The networks had never done it. And Steve Bornstein, who was um, uh, the visionary of ESPN at that time, had this thought in mind. He wanted to have a staple event uh, studio show to to really kick off the day for college football. 
and he wanted to do the same thing with the NFL. And and uh, I was sort of the, you know, for lack of a better analogy, <laughs> of the, the Chris Berman was to the NFL what Tim Brando was to college football. And as someone that was young and and, and very in, influenced by decision makers at that time, I was honored. I mean, I was really flattered. So that position sort of evolved. And uh, but I always wanted to do games. I was always even when I was hosting the show. Uh, I wanted to do games. I, I wasn't happy where I was. I had happy feet. I was chasing. I wanted to do games and was never seemingly that satisfied with being in an anchor desk. Um, you know, the fact that I happened to be good enough at it that someone wanted to hire me specifically for it, I, as I look back on it, I wish I'd been more grateful uh, for the opportunity. But I was in such a rush to do games that, you know, I didn't think about it. You know, when you're young, you're just trying to get ahead and move and, and, uh, and without promoting yourself too much, just try to do a good job and, and hope that your assignments improve over time. Um, so the industry changed, and I was a part of it, and uh, I look back on it now with, uh, with glee. I mean, I'm very proud to have my name associated with what I did at ESPN at that time. I don't look back... Uh, at all, though, because I knew what I was doing when I left it was for my own personal and professional good, and it all worked out in the end, because now, you know, it took me a long time, even at, even at CBS, it was a funny <laughs> thing, it took really getting that job for me to appreciate what ESPN had done for me. Um, I was calling games again in 1996, 1997, doing uh, Raycom's Jefferson Pilots uh, SEC Games of the Week, and I was calling the Braves and the Hawks and working for Turner and the NBA oh, yeah. in the time that I'd left ESPN. And uh, when when they hired me at CBS initially, it was because everybody had left CBS to go to Fox because they had gotten the NFL in 1994, so it created a few opportunities. And that 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 got me the job but then when the nfl came back to cbs in 98 uh jim nance had to go back and do the nfl today and he had been doing the college show and that created an opening there and uh, and they said tim you know uh, you're pretty identified as a studio host for college football we need you there so and that that was a great run too that lasted uh you know all the way to 2013 so uh I, I did some games, as you know, when we had double hitters. Uh, right. If Vern wasn't doing the game and we had two games, I did the games. Um, but there was no real guarantee that when Vern was done that I was going to get that job. And and uh, I had gotten to a point now, I'm, I'm sort of in my late 50s at this point, and uh, the opportunity arose for me at Fox, and I'm doing exactly you know what I want to do, calling college football and college basketball. And after, you know, I'm, I don't even do a radio or television show anymore on a daily basis. I'm not doing any sports talk of any kind except guesting. But this yeah, is the first this. time really in my career. <laughs> when I've been at that, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the first time I've, I've ever really been able to say I'm only doing exactly what I want to be doing. Uh, I think at, at some point in my career I was always doing a few things that I felt like maybe I needed to do or should do, but I wasn't necessarily – jacked up about doing now uh i've reached a point and and fox has enabled me to do that to say hey tim here's what you do you live in this lane okay you're one of our college football guys you go do that and then you're one of our college basketball guys you go do that and uh i'm thrilled to say that um you know it's been a long-lasting career as a result but 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 gowdy was my my um my hero as a, a broadcaster uh, other than my father. My dad was in television. He helped put uh, local television stations, two of them, on the air in my hometown. A writer, producer, uh, a, an advertising agent. I mean, he did it all. They, uh, all these guys that were my parents' age had to wear all all the hats. You know, they had to be a jack <laughs> exactly. really all the trades. And I grew up knowing in a local television station what I wanted to do for a living. So I can't remember... The exact time that I knew I wanted to be a sportscaster, but as a child of TV, I can remember watching uh, the Red River Shootout in 1961, 62, Army, Navy with Staubach and Stitchway. I was gravitated to live TV. I think anybody that was maybe six years old in 1962 could understand where I'm coming from. The fact that you could turn on your TV and see a live ball game, and then watching the guys do it, uh, like Gowdy, who had this masculine voice, a real man's man, and then on Sunday afternoons at a tape show, 
on ABC called The American Sportsman, where he's out with celebrities, you know, in a duck blind, drinking <laughs> bourbon and shooting <laughs> geese. You know, I mean, I think it was geese. Might have been no, no, it was ducks. If you're in a duck blind, it's supposed to be ducks. So yes, <laughs> uh, I thought, what a cool, what a cool life to have. You know, what a cool uh, business to be in. And uh, so I followed that path, and and with the help of um, good timing and um, a father that was uh, well aware and was also connected in the business told me what uh, to do and not to do, sort of like having a professor in your house. Uh, it helped me get going started. Uh, really got, helped me get started early. I was 14 when I did my first high school football play-by-play, and I did it with my father. Now, we were a father and son play-by-play team oh, in 1971. That's an awesome story yeah. right there. That's great. Well, playing off that, what's your most memorable game that you can remember calling? What stands out most about it? I mean, what what is an event that you were like, man, that's it? <laughs> like, that's the one. <laughs> there, are, there are so many from the NCAA tournament that uh, in those years that I worked them uh, for CBS, I, it, I would be leaving out a buzzer beater. You know, I had, I had a ton of them. But one in particular I had in 1998, I was working alongside Al McGuire, the late great Al McGuire of Marquette fame, won the national title in 77 and basketball's first flower child. He was a unique individual. I think of all the greats in broadcasting and dynamic personalities I worked with, and I worked with them all, you know, from, and I still do work with Bill Raftery, who I think is maybe the all-time best, um, you know, from generation to generation, but Vital, McGuire, Billy Packer, you name them, I worked with them. Uh, uh, Jimmy Valvano, uh, who was, um, uh, sadly, his career was cut short, but he was, God only knows how great he would have been had he lived a full life as a broadcaster, not just a coach and a personality. But um, You know who I remember the most with you? I I remember Joe Dean the most. Oh yeah, that's so, my it, FCC day. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. it was great. Great yeah. with you. We did a ton, and, and and his father, of course, was the father of SEC basketball, uh, Joe Dean Senior, who worked with John Ferguson in my earliest days watching TV in the '60s and '70s. I grew up <laughs> on watching Joe's dad, you know, and uh, Mr. Converse. But there, you name the guy that you connect to college basketball. I probably worked with him. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. yeah. At some point, but but Al was a Renaissance man, and you could learn a lot not just about the business, but about life if you were with him for three or more weeks. And I was for about three years. We worked the NCAA's together, and uh, he was in the twilight of his life and his career. And uh, so we're doing this game, and and Stanford uh, is is playing for the right to go to the Final Four against Rhode Island. Uh, Rhode Island had a couple of great guards, Tyson Wheeler and Catino Mobley, the, the big cat, and uh, and Stanford had uh, the Mad Dog, Mark Madsen, and uh, oh, yeah. Arthur Lee, and a lot of other you know really good players. And they're down by six with about 50 seconds to play. Jim Herrick is coaching Rhode Island, and Mike Montgomery's coaching Stanford. We're playing in St. Louis, and just this you know incredible number of wacky, crazy plays happen including a steal off an inbounds pass and a pass to Madsen from Arthur Lee for a dunk and a foul and a three-point play to get Stanford the lead. Uh, They wind up winning it at the end. It wasn't a buzzer beater, but it was just a bizarre way for the game to end. And I'll never forget, I'm on the air with Al, and uh, he (laughs) – he, the, the Stanford kids are going nuts, and they had a mascot that was a tree. They still do. <laughs> Fear uh, the tree. Yep. It's a big fir tree, and Al is out of, at the, on the court dancing <laughs> with the tree. <laughs> and oh, that's I, awesome. I remember, um, I remember, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm having to talk while he's dancing, and and that might have been the most difficult thing for me to describe. <laughs> Al McGuire dancing with a tree. <laughs> and the great. team, obviously. Oh, yeah. Dancing with the team and the tree. Yeah, I was out in was uh, a, I was in Stanford about three weeks ago, and uh, and yeah, the yeah. tree is everywhere, everywhere it's out everywhere. there. You <laughs> can't get away from it on the farm. That's why they call it the farm. They got a lot of trees. Oh yes. But uh, it was that was a blast. And and football, there, you know, not as many opportunities. I'm, I'm asked a lot about. Uh, 
uh, you seem to be for someone that's been in the business uh, so energetic and passionate and and really I think the truth is as much fun as and as much as I got out of being in the studio those years I was always like a caged animal wanting to get out to call the games and uh, even though uh, I'm, I'm considered a, a, a you know a veteran, uh, and that might be a nice way of putting it uh, <laughs> in this business because I've lasted so long, I sort of believe that my best football is yet to come. I don't think that uh, I've even really scratched the surface. I've done a lot of meaningful games, important games, uh, but not the kind of games that resonate in my mind to the extent that they should have. So. Uh, that's why I feel so blessed now to be doing what I'm doing every week. And, you know, the best way of putting it is this, fellas. Uh, somebody will say to me, uh, gosh, Tim, we miss you in that studio on, on CBS. And I'll tell them, oh, I appreciate that. And, and I was part of it for a long time, and it was great. And that Florida-Alabama game when they were one and two oh, yeah. was tremendous. And, and uh, the, the, the Iron Bowl and the kick six. I was in the studio for the highest rated regular season game in the history of college football. But guess what? They don't replay halftime. You know, they don't <laughs> that's, replay that's true. the pregame. That is true. Uh, that's that, you know, Vern, Vern, uh, God bless him is another one I looked up to and, and, uh, and he had a wonderful run and, and was very deserving of that. And, uh, when Fox talked to me about coming to work there, uh, in the summer of 14, gosh, it was in about this, I had only inked the deal with them in July of 2014 um, to go there. And when they were talking to me about coming, you know, when you're 58, uh, you know, executives don't necessarily get a lot of credit for hiring someone that's been in the business 30 years and is 58 years old. So I I feel really blessed. Uh, My business, just like the coaching profession, is about youth, and it's a, a young man's game. And I... I remember my boss, John Entz, at the time, as I was going through their executive car wash, saying to me, uh, well, Tim, where do you see yourself here? And I said, well, you know, I I, I see where you're evolving and you're growing your network. Uh, you got a four-year-old cable operation here, and you're trying to grow it. Um, In 1985, when I started at ESPN, they were nine years old, and they were trying to grow uh, through college sports, college basketball, college football. Um, you know, I, I look at where you are in your evolution as a network and where I am uh, in my career at this stage, and I hearken back to where Jim Simpson was in his career uh, as, as the number two guy to Kurt Gowdy at NBC and what he meant to ESPN. And I think about my, my friend Vern Lundquist, who had never been a number one guy. He, would all, he was the number two NFL guy, and really it was a demotion when he got the SEC gig. They hired Dick Enberg at CBS to come over after NBC lost the AFC and uh, and they gave Enberg the job that, that Vern had and said, you know, as a golden parachute, here's here's the SEC, Vern. Well, I think that was the greatest thing that ever happened in his career. Oh, absolutely. I mean, think about what happened with the SEC when he went there. And uh, so it, 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 timing and, uh, and your ability to accept decisions and be okay with them and move on because you can't always control what goes on around you. Uh, Vern was the best at that. And uh, so when he said to me, where do you see yourself? I, I thought about Simpson and I, and I said to him, uh, you know, you got great young talent here. Gus Johnson is tremendous. He's got a wonderful following, big time voice, made his name on the NCAAs. He got these really great young guys coming up. And I, I see that but maybe you need a guy that's been in it for 30 years and has a lot of contacts and um, has, has a voice that's associated with the sport. And uh, I, I see myself as maybe being in the position Vern was. Oh, so absolutely. I, said, I literally said this. I, so I, I said, let me be your Vern. Let me be Fox's version of, of Vern, uh, because that's really where I saw myself. With the idea being, I can help you in certain areas and, uh, and maybe – Young producers, young directors, guys that are trying to, you know, uh, uh, get their uh, their bones earned, as we like to say in the business. Maybe I can help them a little bit, and uh, and and obviously that clicked was something they like hearing, and and uh, I just re-upped with them for another four years, so I'm very excited about. It. 
Well, that, that kind of leads us into another question. Uh, and we got to bring in Chris Valiga here in about 10 minutes. But, it, Tim, you're going to stay on with us if that's okay with you. Um, sure. He, he is Tim Brando. You can catch him calling games on Fox Sports this year. They just added the Big Ten. They've already got the Big 12. they got the Pac-12. Uh, make sure and check him out hosting Episode 3 of Football Saturdays on Raycom Sports this Saturday. Now, you said you joined with uh, Fox Sports back in 2014. You recently signed a multi-year extension to keep calling football and basketball right. at Fox. Now, your voice was synonymous right. with SEC football for years. Uh, tell me, what's the biggest difference between SEC football and the Big 12 and Pac-12 that you've been calling for the last few years? It's more of a way of life in the Deep South. It's something that uh, defines the lifestyle of people in our part of the country. I mean, I live born and raised in Shreveport, Louisiana, and when I left Connecticut, I moved my family and my wife, uh, what will be 39 years in October, back to my hometown. You know, I, I, it, it's authentic when I call it Chateau Brando. I mean, <laughs> that, that's this is where we live. And uh, I really firmly believe that in our profession, you're gone a lot, so when you come home, you better be really excited about being home. And... Uh, I learned a lot of lessons about myself and about life in the time that I was in Bristol. And uh, like I said, I value that time. And I I wish I had appreciated what we were accomplishing at the time we were accomplishing it more. But I certainly do now. And any of the ESPN lifers that are out there, many of whom got cut a few uh, years ago and even more that got cut uh, about a month or so ago, my heart goes out to them because I know how hard they worked and how they built that place uh, and made it, you know, the sports broadcasting empire that it is. And I appreciate that fact. And I think my colleagues um, in sports broadcasting, whether they work at Fox or anywhere else, also appreciate uh, what ESPN accomplished. They should because <laughs> it's um, one of the great it's one of the great success stories of uh, of this century in my mind. Oh, but, nice. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, that, that being said, that being said, I, I don't, I don't know that, um, uh, I don't know that at any point in time, uh, for me anyway, did I, did I feel that not being happy, uh, that I could be unhappy in this business. I, I never thought about that. It never occurred to me that if I was doing what I loved, it didn't matter where I lived. You could have sent me to Timbuktu. When I was 25 years old, I thought you could send me anywhere and I'd be happy. Uh, but I found out that wasn't true. Uh, Southerners <laughs> take for granted what it's like to live in the South until they leave. And and I and I really did. Uh, I, I miss the humidity. I mean, I miss sweating. I miss My the goodness. idea that... that <laughs> yeah, I mean, I really did, because... Uh, in the Northeast, if you're a Southerner, you might not see the sun on a daily basis until, you know, late June. Uh, it can be dark and dreary and and cold, and it was just tough. It was very difficult. I think the hardest winters they had were the winters I was there. Uh, <laughs> and I moved back home. And I, Southerners, Southerners, I think, believe, from a college football standpoint, because there's not as much pro sports. You know, up in the Northeast, no matter how good it is at Boston College or how, how good it is at Rutgers or how good it is at Penn State, there's always Philadelphia or the Yankees or the Phillies or the uh, Red Sox. It, it, it's a pro sports world that they live in. That's right. And in the South, largely, largely because most of the pro sports franchises didn't move South until I was about 12 years old. You know, the Falcons, the Saints. All those teams came in in the 60s, 67. I was about 11 years old when those teams were brought into the league. As good as those teams might be, and the Saints won a Super Bowl, for crying out loud. But I don't know that the passion for the Saints will ever be as strong as the passion for LSU in Louisiana. Oh, I mean, I, I don't. I don't. That. Same would be true for the Falcons and, and the University of Georgia. I, I don't know that I, I would think a Georgia national title would resonate more oh, than a Falcon Super Bowl. Yes, it absolutely no doubt would. It. No, yeah, no question. So I, I think that's what separates uh, the SEC fan fan from the fan of the other of the other locations, uh, whether it be Pac-12 or um, uh, or any, you know any other league. Now the Big Ten's got some pro sports areas, but I will say their history, and this is one of the things Fox is 
so excited about the history of Michigan and Ohio State and now with Penn State and the Big Ten and really flourishing. Uh, those are homes that are going to be watching FS1 and Fox for college football for the first time this year. You know, uh, college sports is really regional. You know, I got fans in my own hometown that think I retired because I'm not doing the SEC. <laughs> you know, they're, they're like, well, well, Tim, we really loved you. You, uh, you, you're in the Barker Lounge now? What you doing with yourself? And I'm like, well, I'm on every Saturday. I was just in Austin, Texas doing the Texas Tech, Texas game. Oh, I miss that. I think I was watching LSU exactly. or Alabama. Or right. that. So, I mean, fans are fans of college football, very provincial, very protective, and uh, understandably so. That's what makes it great. So, uh, you know, the, that's that's probably also the biggest difference between the NFL and, and the college game. Uh, you, when you're doing a college game, it may be national, meaning it's available to everyone, but largely – you know, you might be getting a 60. If I, if, let's say, for instance, I'm doing um, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. We had Bedlam to close our season last year. Did a great rating. It was on the same day as all the championship games. And it was big because the winner was going to go into, um, you know, one of the New Year's Six games. But they they weren't going to be in the, in the college football playoff. But we, I mean, in Oklahoma City, uh, we were probably getting 80% of the homes. And in Dallas, we probably got 60% of the homes. But when you got outside that area... There was nothing. It, it just doesn't... It, there's, yeah. I mean, it doesn't so resonate. College football, yeah, college football fans believe their school, their team colors, are the only ones in the country. That's all that exists. And it defines who they are, not just as um, as fans, but as human beings. They believe that... Their team is their way of life, and the opponent is the villain, the ones that are trying to infringe on their way of life. Oh, absolutely. Which makes it both fan, which makes it great, but also sometimes frustrating because um, they don't always see the big picture. And we're all, you know, announcers are always trying to tell people the impact of this game will resonate. Here's why it can impact where this team goes in the next ranking, and blah blah blah. And I think some fans get that but they're still on the learning curve trying to get it. Yeah, I do agree. All right, now we have to take a break for just a second. got to get Chris Fleek in here. Uh, we're going to run a few ads and whatnot, but Tim, you're cool with, uh, with hanging out for just a little bit? Oh, absolutely. Good deal. All right, uh, let's see. Give us 30 seconds. Uh, coming up next on Winning Cures Everything, we've got Chris Felica from ESPN's College Game Day, and we're going to keep Tim Brando, which is a nice surprise. So we'll be back on Winning Cures Everything on Local X. This is Gary Seegers, your co-host and owner of Winning Cures Everything, the best sports blog and podcast in the South. There are a ton of ways that you can connect with us. First, check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. Second, give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. Third, follow us on Twitter, at winningcures, or myself, at ProSevereGary, or at Chris B. Giannini. Four, email the show. Winnie Cures Everything at gmail.com. Fifth, download, subscribe to, and review the podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all of your favorite podcast apps. We'll have new shows up every Tuesday and Friday morning along with different articles throughout the week. Remember, winningcureseverything.com. Welcome back in to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris on Local X. Joining us on the show is the research producer for ESPN's College Game Day. He provides stats and information for the on-air and production crews uh, leading up to and during each week's telecast. He does the Bear Necessities segment on the show. He also co-hosts one of our favorite podcasts, ESPN's Behind the Bets podcast uh, during the football season. You know him as the Bear. He is Chris Felica. Chris, myself, my co-host Chris, and Tim Brando. Thank you for coming on with us. <laughs> I, I, absolutely. Looking forward to it. It's going to be a, a good time. Hopefully the first of many. That's, now tell me this. Have you two done an interview together before? No, no, we no. have not. We've, pro- we've crossed paths on the road many times, but uh, have not done anything together yet. So this is the first. No, um, we no, we haven't. And I will say this. Uh, I'll give you a little quick history lesson on uh, the foundation of, of ESPN. There was no research department at ESPN in 1985. <laughs> all right. Um, now they they acquired 
a research department on the basis of of college game day becoming a reality. Um, they had some guys that they used um, uh, for for the USFL, and uh, they didn't have any programming. I mean, in those days, other than college basketball, the only live programming they had was Australian rules football. Okay, so there wasn't a lot <laughs> there to work with. But when when you, you got to go back to the University of Georgia and Oklahoma lawsuit against the NCAA, they were carrying in the mid '80s, um, in 1983, 1984. Jim Simpson, Paul McGuire were doing college football games on tape delay because they didn't have the rights to to doing it live until Georgia and Oklahoma filed a federal lawsuit that the Supreme Court ruled. Uh, in favor of an antitrust case to enable cable television to carry uh, college football as the schools got the rights away from the NCAA. I mean, all the talk about uh, the BCS and college football and and, uh, all the rhetoric for the last 30-plus years, I've always had to remind people of this, but that's, that's really what happened, and it was just as I was beginning my career there, calling games, and uh the first research guy hired was to, his job was to do college game day, was Howie Schwab from Stump the Schwab fame. And That's, Y'all were talking Howie about this on built, Twitter today. Yeah, <laughs> how, yeah. Howie, Howie built an empire of research, including uh, John Coleman'sberger, who worked with me at CBS, JK, we affectionately call him. There, there's countless examples of guys that came from uh, the Howie tree, and, and Chris is, a, is another example of that. Uh, you know, you're right, Howie's someone who had a major impact on my career path and, and really uh, mentoring me and just my, my passion for college football and college basketball. And obviously those are two things that were are near and dear to Howie's heart. And, and, and Howie was somebody that I certainly tried to emulate and, and, and take after and uh, always try and pick up bits and pieces of knowledge on things to look for and how to do things and uh, and really make uh, the, the on-air personalities and uh, the telecast itself, it, it best it can be. And uh, there are a lot of people on that building, and a lot of people, like you said, are no longer in that building that uh, that oh, how he did of gratitude, that's for sure. And now, Chris, that kind of leads me into you. Now, we did this with Tim before, and since uh, both of you are first timers, I, I wanted to start at the very beginning with you. Now, you're from Long Island, New York, right? It, I can mm-hmm. understand the love for gambling, but how in the world did you get involved <laughs> with college football? It's actually funny. Um, a lot of my family is uh, northeastern, uh, eastern Pennsylvania, and were rabid, avid Penn State fans. Okay. So my my okay. first love of following college football really was uh, knowing that they went to Penn State, had an affinity for Penn State, and, and kind of they got me in, involved in the passion of that. And then uh, I think the 86, 87 Fiesta Bowl, I should say, uh, I was about 14, 15 at the time, and really I, I had started to, to pick up on Miami right when, uh, when, when, ha- when Howard won the national title and Jimmy started to get things going. I kind of gravitated towards them as I got into junior high and high school and, uh, and, and followed them, and they became my favorite team, and it's actually where I wound up going to school. So uh, it, it's kind of a weird uh, uh, Penn State got me into it, and then I became a Miami fan and then I lost to Penn State. And so uh, it kind of kind of a, real, <laughs> a weird circle of life right there. Absolutely. It's, so you've been. Uh, so if there's no if there's no Pete Gipsopolis, <laughs> there's no bear. <laughs> yeah, there, 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 no, there are no five any Testaverde uh, intercepting. There's no uh, no DJ Dozier. None of that. Uh, I love it. I so, love it. So this is the 30th anniversary of College Game Day. It all started 19. Uh, it started going on the road 1993. You've been with ESPN since 1996. You're discussing gambling lines, um, and that didn't start until 2015. Yeah, I, don't I was about think. to say you didn't really start doing that until recently. So uh, I don't know. Uh, well, here let me let me jump in here. Um, you didn't start discussing the gambling lines until 2015. What what went into gambling lines and odds being included in the coverage of college football, not only on game day but also on ESPN? Like, was it difficult to get passed through? And, and by chance, I, did you have anything to do with that? I, I think for a long time, we insinuated it in such a way, and, and, and Lee Corso was closer than the experts think, and, and trying to throw in, <laughs> and, and Chris Powell trying to subtly throw in 
a uh, little Vegas slants and, and tips and things like that. Well, Musburger was always here, big with it. Like oh, he, of course. And our and friends of course, in the Michaels with the, with, the, with the great. He goes over the goal line for the touchdown. And he, it was out there. And I think finally, uh, I don't want to say saner minds prevailed, but people finally just realized and understood that there's a large facet of our audience and viewership that they're watching the show for information to, to bet on games, gamble on games, pick games. What, and, and even if you're not a, a gambler, it, it's interesting to, uh, to get a note about a perception of uh, this team is expected to blow out this team or this team is an underdog and not expected to win. But when they are not expected to win, they usually do pretty well and are capable of pulling some up. So, so a couple of years back, I think we finally just came to the realization, you know what? We're just going to give it, and we'll we'll push it as far as we can. If we get asked to scale back a little bit, we will, and uh, and, and we, it just became a little unique element where once we went to three hours, uh, Lee sitting the producer and, and and Kirk Erskine had been wanting to get me involved for the longest time, and and, and Lee really came up with the idea of uh, just saying, you know what, let's give you a board. You're going to pick three games a week against the spread, and we'll and we'll, and we'll see how it goes. And uh, it, it, it's been a lot of fun and a good way to try and. Uh, implement some of the, some of the, uh, the the Vegas and gambling nuggets in there. Well, right, Chris now, is speaking to something that let me let me let me throw this caveat in. Okay, there would have been no college game day. There would have been no college game day had there not been a yearn from the people in television that there was an audience there for gambling and gambling only for college football. Okay, right. Uh, especially the northeastern audience uh, and, and the paternal thing his background being where it was and being a New York guy. Uh, Penn State was sort of the team of the East for a long time. They won all those Lambert trophies. It was Schwartzwalter at Syracuse and and and, and Paterno at uh, at Penn State. Bino was all over this, okay? And everything that Corso picked up, uh, and he listened very closely, okay, not only to the executives that hired him, and I did his audition tape, he listened to those guys, he knew what Steve Bornstein, who was our uh, president at the time, wanted. Hold on, his i got to interrupt Bill you. Creasy, did, did you uh, do? You, you might remember that name. Do you remember that name, Chris? You've heard the name Bill oh, Creasy, haven't you? I, 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 yes, I, 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 I've been to. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. More than one, I've been to more than one Belmont Stadium. Yes, yes. <laughs> Tim, did, did you guy, say that you did Lee Corso's? Did, did, did you do Lee Corso's audition tape? Yes, I did. Good uh, I did, gracious. I did uh, pretty much everybody's <laughs> audition tape back in those days. Uh, and it was either going to be Pepper Rogers or it was going to be Lee Corso. Wow, Pepper and Rogers. Pepper was a great storyteller. Pepper was a great storyteller, but, but Lee was ahead of the game in terms of speaking in sound bites and in absolutes, and they loved that. Uh, and he also listened. And Creasy, who had Bornstein's ear, kept saying, Listen, there are ways to tell the better which way to go without laying the number. And closer than the experts think was something that, you know, Lee fashioned off that. But he also listened and learned from Bino. You know, the whole, and I, I've had this conversation with Fowler many times. You know, Chris was doing Scholastic Sports America when I was doing it. And a lot of people don't remember, but when I stopped hosting game day, I, I didn't get replaced by Chris Fowler. It was Bob Carpenter for one year. Uh, who's now doing Washington Nationals baseball and was calling <laughs> games like I was. I mean, Chris was so young, I don't think they knew he was ready to take it, but he was built to host it, and he made that show what it is. Editorially, I don't think there was anyone more gifted and, and better for that show at the time, and he took it to the next level. As I, as I told you guys earlier, I, I had happy feet. I wanted to be at games even when I was hosting game day, but... But, but Bino was willing to be the butt of the joke. That was the other thing. You know, if he had a bad week picking games uh, and he went 0-6, we'd put him in a manhole cover in Manhattan with a hard hat on <laughs> and make him look like a fool. And Bino didn't care. He was like, you're always making fun of me, Brando. Why do you do that? Like, well, <laughs> I don't a fix it all. Perfect. You're going to have to buy me center at the 21 club for crying out loud <laughs> he we dressed him up in all kinds of outfits we didn't have much of a budget but we did have costumes in those days and he we put him in anything and he'd do it and lee who <laughs> lee corso at that time uh chris was our kirk kirk street you know he he was the x's and o's guy but he had a great personality and he watched bino like a hawk 
and I know you've probably had these conversations with Lee, uh, and one of the things I love about him is he's not, never forgotten his roots. He learned a lot from Bino, and at a time in his career when maybe his star power would have been fading, and Craig James came in first, and then when Craig, uh, Craig came in my last year there, and I was hosting um, halftimes and in-between games, it had become a two-guy two, uh, deal back in those days. Uh, and Tarico replaced me in 94. But my last year in 93, I'll never forget this. Uh, we had all these conversations, Corso and I did, driving from our hotel to uh, the, the airport. And uh, and he said to me, he said, you know, if you're going to stay in this business, you better learn to be the butt of the joke. I love that about Bino. And look what he did. Uh, he, he became the crown, uh, really, I think, the prince of, of Saturdays. I mean, I... I don't care what anyone says about what he went through medically, okay? Uh, but what that did after he had those strokes uh, and what he and how he's tried to bounce back by staying on the air, not only was, you know, admirable for him and for ESPN to retain him, but it also brought a human quality from Chris and from Herbie because you could tell they were helping him. And it made them, it humanized the whole show. But that last segment, fellas, Chris, I'm t- that last segment, I want Lee Corso and Lee Corso only to do that last segment with the headgear. I mean, that is, that's become the five minutes of television that I don't miss and I don't think anybody misses. Oh, no, it's the highest rate. Go ahead. Go ahead. Chris, gonna, you're jumping. I, I, I was, I was, I was going to say that yeah, everyone who watches the show and will talk to me about the headgear and every. And their their comments are similar to that, and like that is the the five or seven minutes of the week that they just don't want to miss because they don't want they have no idea what he's going to do next. He's going to come riding in on, on, on a bison. He, he's going to be <laughs> tackling Bill Murray with the spear. He's going to be dropping f bombs by accident. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he, it's un, it's unbelievable. And, and you you hit on something uh, in him and watching and observing Bino. He always reminds us, and week after week, he, he says, we are in the entertainment business, college football. Yes, absolutely. Business. So he absolutely yes. gets it that you need to be funny, be humorous, give a little football, but make sure you're entertaining the public, and, and, and he's done it so, so well. So Yeah, I mean, just don't take yourself so seriously. And he, he saw that from Bino, and he took it to another level. Um you know, Bino was incredibly insecure, maybe the most insecure man I ever met, but it drove him. And he'd get through doing something where he was the butt of the joke, Chris, and he'd say, Brando, do you think I went too far? Is it over? <laughs> Will I ever work again? Are they going to bring me back? Is it over? I mean, and Lee just laughed, and I did too. But but, but the, the key for Corso's uh, endurance has been his willingness to get, you know, he knows a lot of football. I mean, he knows he a does. ton. Uh, and most of it, most of it, most people in America don't see now. But the guys like Chris that are there each day and are watching the build up and a part of the preparation, they know how much football he imparts to Chris and to Herbie, or excuse me, Reese and Herbie and everybody else. I wish people could spend a, a game, actually go to the game with him on the sideline. It, it's like he's still yeah. coaching. He's out there inside right. the hashes just, and, and just to to walk with him and just he's he's still quick he's the observations he has are, it, it's unbelievable and you're right and, and you mentioned about Chris and Reese and, and Herbie and it really is I don't want to say special or touching but that's kind of the right word and to, to, to see how if Lee forgets a word or kind of gets loses his train of thought a little yeah. bit they're right in there to jump in massage it make it seamless and, and just kind of catch him right up and, and, and he gets right back with it. so up uh, and uh, for those who didn't watch game day prior to Lee having a stroke and when we went back and did some of the anniversary footages and a piece on Lee and some of the old moments when we reminisced you talk about a guy that was quick witted and sharp oh, yeah. on it and the sense yeah. of humor was and that's the that's the one thing that unfortunately in he hasn't fully recovered from, but other than that, he is the intelligence and the observations are still so so good. 
Now we've we've got about yeah. twelve yeah. minutes left in this, so let me let me hop in. I want to get a couple of questions in that are actually here. You go ahead and knock this one out first. So being on a show like Game Day, you're making picks against schools because you're always going to pick somebody to win. That means somebody's got to lose. Which schools do you guys recognize give y'all the most pushback on Twitter and social media? And so, Chris, go ahead and, and you jump in first, and then Tim, I want you to jump in after. <laughs> uh, I would say I would say there were two last year that kind of gave me a little bit of grief. Uh, the first one was Florida, and, and I think maybe it's a lot of people associate me as a Miami alum, and I don't know why Florida fans were giving me grief for picking them to lose most of the time, because I picked them to win the SEC East. I picked them to, to beat Tennessee, and they wound up blowing a, a double-digit lead and losing. And any other times I picked against them, they got blown out by Alabama, they got blown out by Arkansas, they got blown out by Florida State. I was kind of right. I blew it in the ball game. I did pick Iowa in the ball game, but uh, and, and then I think Oklahoma, just because I, I've been a little bit critical of just the, the Big Twelve in general being the fifth, uh, number five of the Power Five conferences, and just saying how I didn't think. Uh, Oklahoma with those two those two losses, the, the committee wasn't going to forgive that. A- and I think as Oklahoma continued to win and win the conference, um, and I just said, hey, this is how it's going to be. They lost to Ohio State. They lost to Houston. The Big 12 was the fifth of the power conference. They're not going to put a two-loss conference champion with, with no out-of-conference wins in it. And I think they took a little bit of offense to that. So hey, I, think, you, I think Florida and Oklahoma would be nice. You are not the only person that has told us Florida. We had uh, – I don't know if you know who Funny Man is, but we had him on last week. He's an Alabama comedian, and he told mm-hmm. us that Florida is the absolute worst to him. It's not Auburn. It's not Tennessee. It's not LSU. It's Florida, that they are on him like dogs all the time. All right, now, Tim, you, you make a lot – you are the one that goes, like – out of out of this world with some of your picks, right? And and we appreciate that because you don't stick to the status quo. Well, it's easy to pick Alabama and Ohio State every year, right? So now with you, it, like what what makes you want to pick those? You know, just you picked uh, Louisville, I think, what in twenty thirteen to win the national championship when nobody had them. Yeah, like, when they had, right when they you, had Bridgewater at quarterback. Yes, so a lot, that was based on schedule. A lot of that is. Um, my preseason picks are not about where teams, I believe. That's not a starting grid. It's where I think they'll wind up, and usually it's about schedule. A little bit of the ghost of Bino that's still within me. You know, I spent all those <laughs> 6 o'clock uh, <laughs> breakfast at the Plainville, the Plainville Holiday Inn. You know, they didn't even have friendlies across the street, Chris, when I was there. So um, there was a lot of dark mornings there with Bino. It's all about the schedule, you know, and uh, so that's part of it. I don't pick games regularly anymore because I don't have a radio show uh, any longer. I retired that a couple of seasons ago, but uh, I would say blowback is always going to be there. I don't care. Every school's got, you know, the the the, the whack job uh, fans. They're, that's just part of it, which makes it great. I mean, it's both the, the difference with me and other guys that do what I do is I actually engage some of these 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 nutcases uh, on Twitter and, 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 and it's fun and we love I, it. I really you know it's fun um, but but uh, but you could pick Alabama you could pick Alabama to win the national title okay but but with a loss and piss off most of their fans okay just by saying they're gonna win it all but they're gonna lose a game. Yeah, you're such an LSU homer. You're this. And by the way, my daughter is my one that went to LSU and one that went to Ole Miss. So I'm screwed no matter what if I pick anybody but Alabama. Or and, and and if you don't pick Alabama to cover, you know you might as well be sent to a third world country. So uh, Michigan, I think, is the, the the Midwest version of Alabama. I think both of their fan bases are the ones that are the most offended. If you piss them off, Ohio State's got their fair share, but they're not quite as 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 vile uh, as as Michigan. Alabama, it's a love hate kind of thing, though. I'll, I'll I'll say this: there's not a town in that state that's got a population base of five thousand that doesn't have a Monday lunch or Monday evening quarterback or touchdown club. Okay, whether it's <laughs> Aniston, Gadsden. Muscle Shoals, you name it. And I've probably, at one point in time, probably, Chris, going back to my early days at ESPN, I've spoken to all of them. All those East Davis <laughs> corridors. I've been to them, okay? And I've, I've met And they love, they love the 
to be poked, you know, and they enjoy me poking back. So a lot of it's just in good fun. You know, I, I prefer to, uh, to, to poke the bear, so to speak. No pun intended. <laughs> All right, now we've got about five minutes left. Let me get in one last question. Now this will be a, a gambling question, but it kind of works for both. Uh, Chris, let me go on and get your answer on this. Um, here, you go ahead and jump in here. And then, Tim, I want yours afterwards. All right. So, for me, when I was in college, I remember betting. You know, that was when I first started gambling on stuff. And the Dallas Cowboys, every week, one season, whether I bet on them or bet against them, I lost. They were just the absolute killer for me. Did you, Chris, you, you do a lot of betting. I don't know if Tim partakes so much or if he wants to put that out no, there. No, I really don't. But no, I, uh, I but, love talking. It, but I don't. Well, well, do you do you remember Chris having any team that just you were snake bit? No matter who you pick, when you pick them, that you just always lose on them. Uh, I, I think there are a lot. I, I think in, uh, Oklahoma State is a team when when I either picked off, picked them in the column or picked against them in the column. Uh, they're they're a team that I tend to have very very little success with. I mean, I, I picked them to, to to beat some teams and. <laughs> They, they would lose as a big favorite. I picked them to, to, to get blown out in Bedlam or beat Baylor, or, and, and, and it would go completely the other way. But, uh, yeah, I, I think Oklahoma State would be that one team in terms of the column in the podcast that I just have a, uh, a hard time putting my finger on. Now, Tim, when you would make predictions, you know, on, on the radio show and just wherever, on Fine Bomb Show and whatnot, mm-hmm. it, were there any teams that just always seemed to do the exact opposite of, of what you wanted them to or what you predicted? No, no, I don't. I don't think so. I never. It, it, I, I didn't. It didn't matter that much to me. Uh, so I, if if it happened, it wasn't that. Imp- uh, the, one of the great things about Chris is that what he does, and I and I love the logic to this. Uh, Reese and, and the guys on the set love him getting the pushback, so it keeps them from getting nailed. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know. I mean, it's great, right? But, but he also he'll always be beloved by them. Okay, so it's one one less thing for them to get you know a lot of pushback on, but but I, I'll say this: uh, everyone remembers when you miss; they never remember when you're right. They love pointing out. Now, here's the great: uh, this is what levels it all out. And again, I go back to, to my old friend Bino Cook on this one. Uh, he always used to say, "If you're wrong, admit it. Just tell him you." You screw up. It's you know you you were wrong. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, noted the the Catholics versus convicts game. Uh, I lost the bet to Bino. I said there was no way he had gone zero and six the week before. <laughs> and I, I, I he was they due. Included, they should have they should have included the Catholics versus Cleveland Gary. I'm sorry, that was not a fumble. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, I. I, I told him he was out of his mind, he was out of his gourd, Miami was going to win the game, and he looked at me and he pointed the finger. I was one of the highlights of our early days of game days. Brando, if Notre Dame wins, you go sing the victory march in front of the team. And you know what? The following week, I did it. The following week, I flew there and did it. <laughs> and and when, whenever you're wrong, when you fess up to being wrong, America loves it. So a lot of times, it's the way you react to being incorrect that wins over people. That's the other great thing about you, Chris. Uh, that I really enjoyed. I watch the show. If I'm not doing a noon or 12:30 game, uh, I'm always watching game day. I mean, I don't miss it. And uh, when you've had a rough week, you admit it. And that's what makes uh, you know sports television great. You know, and and separates it from you know news and political genre. It, you know, the, the people won't stop saying that they're right and everybody else is wrong. In sports, when we screw it up, we can say we screwed up. And win some friends as a result. And that's one of the things I admire most about not just the show, but specifically the role you play. I appreciate that. And, and, and yeah, I certainly admit, like last year I got off to a terrible start. And then I, it, 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 I wound up finishing 30 and 19 on the year on the board, which is pretty pretty darn good. But, yeah, I mean, it, it's yeah. amazing early, early on when, I mean, he couldn't find anything. To, I'm like, hey, well, I'm sorry. I mean, it, 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 it is what it is. And, you you touched on that Bino story about an underdog, and that's something still that always resonates with me. It's always in the back of my head. If I if there's an underdog out there, and Bino said all the time, if you like an underdog, just pick them to win outright because if they lose, no one's going to remember it anyway. 
or you just you're wrong. That's right. But if, but if you're right, the underdog, if the underdog pulls the upset, then you're here. That's why you pick Mississippi State to beat A and M. That when A and M number three in the BCS or whatever it was in the college football playoff, and there's a double digit road on or road favorite, and they lose. That's a one. Well, that's awesome. Name, I finally said to him, fellas. I said to him, I said, Kyle Bino, how did you get that? How how did you? I mean, look back at Catholics versus convicts. How that game went. There was no denying Miami had the better team. He said, Brando, Notre Dame has the best home field advantage since the Kremlin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Never better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, look, we are we are running up on the hour, so let me go ahead and jump out of here. You guys have been absolutely fantastic. Uh, he is Chris Felica from ESPN's College Game Day and the Behind the Bets podcast. You can follow him on at uh, on Twitter at Chris Felica. Uh, he is Tim Brando, the legendary Tim Brando. Follow him on Twitter at Tim Brando. These are the easiest Twitter handles ever. And uh, and catch him on Saturdays this fall, calling games for Fox Sports and FS1. Big Ten games are now included. And catch him on Football Saturdays on Raycom Sports. Uh, Tim, Chris, thank you guys so much for jumping in. we got to get both of you back on again sometime soon. This has been fantastic. Thank you, guys. Anytime. Really it's enjoyed been, it. It's been an honor. My we pleasure. It. This is Gary, host of Winning Cures Everything. If you're looking for affordable custom web design, business cards, brochures, and more, check out Kyle Seegers Designs at kyleseegers.com. Kyle offers full website design, monthly site maintenance, and content management system training. Remember, for all your web design needs, check out kyleseegers.com. That's K-Y-L-E-S-E-G-A-R-S.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris on Local X. Chris, 1997, our freshman year of high school. I'm sure you remember those days. Back in the day, man. Oh, yeah. It is also the 20-year anniversary of of two undefeated national champions not having a chance to play each other. Wow. Now, you remember this year, right? So, yeah, this was this was before the BCS. The last year before the BCS. Right. It was the last defensive player to win a Heisman Trophy. That was Charles, Charles Woodson over Woodson Peyton Manning. Beat Peyton Manning. And the, the, we almost had a civil war again because the indef- South was ready to... Yes, absolutely indefensible. Oh, yeah. I, I agree with that. I mean, I just think it's ridiculous, yeah. but... Um, but yeah, that was uh, that was a little ridiculous. It was Alabama's Mike Dubose's first year. He went four and seven. That included uh, Alabama's first loss to Kentucky in seventy five years at that point, and it was only the second loss to the Wildcats in the school's history. Still, the only other loss. Uh, guys like Ricky Williams, Amon Green, Ron Dane, Jamal Lewis. Those were the hot running backs. Now, I looked at the wide receivers. It was Randy Moss and just a bunch of guys. I think Torrey Holt was playing that year, but, like, that's it. No wonder Charles Woodson won it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there was nothing wide, else. Yeah, wide receivers are garbage. But but listen to the quarterbacks. Like, this oh, is what no, blows no. my mind. This this was this was a good year. Cade McNown at UCLA. Mm-hmm. Ryan Leaf, you know, yeah. Washington State. Right. Peyton Manning. Tim it, Couch. So we judged these people because they weren't great in the NFL, and that's where we last saw them. But in college, these guys were Oh, awesome. they were amazing. These I mean, well, awesome. here's, here's some of the other ones. Tim Couch, mm-hmm. Chad Pennington. Oh, no, he was good. He was good, but it, he was made at Marshall because of Randy Moss. That's right. Randy Moss made every quarterback better. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Batch, Tim Rattay. You remember Tim Rattay? Yeah, like he he's in coaching and whatnot. I was about to say. Yeah, I think he did. he got fired last year by Fresno State, didn't he? I don't know. I thought he was. I knew it was somewhere out in California, but I didn't know it was Fresno. That's it. Dante Culpepper was in Central Florida at the time. Oh yeah. oh yeah. Nick Saban was in his third season at Michigan State in 1997, and he got his first win over a top five team that year. That was a 49 to 14 beatdown of number four Penn State, and it was all the way at the very end of the season, November 29th. Now, the reason I bring this up is Michigan went into the Rose Bowl ranked number one with wins over, like, a bunch of different really good teams. And they beat number eight Washington State 21-16. to And fun fact, that was Mike Price's first Rose Bowl with, uh, with Washington State, with the Cougs. And, I mean, you remember Mike Price. Yes. Briefly. Old Destiny. Yes. Like, Roll Tide, baby. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, <laughs> He had, a, he had a very brief, brief very stint. brief Alabama stint. Uh, yes, and Nebraska went to the Orange Bowl. They were ranked number two. They beat Peyton Manning's number three ranked Tennessee team, 
42 to 17. Now remember, Michigan beat Washington State 21 to 16. And when it was all said and done, Michigan won the AP National Championship. Nebraska won the coaches' poll. Now, for those that don't remember that, if you're a young guy, yeah, then you don't remember this. But it, there were two national champions. There was not just one unified whatever. And Michigan won AP. Nebraska won the coaches. Before the bowls, Michigan was number one in both. They were number one in the coaches' poll. They had 54 number one votes to Nebraska's eight. Afterwards, Nebraska got 32 votes while Michigan had 30. The beatdown of Peyton Manning and UT helped. It combined with Michigan barely squeaking by Washington State. Yeah, huge. But but that Peyton Manning-led team was great. Yeah, they were Everyone really, really good. Everyone thought they had a chance to win the national championship. Had they beaten Nebraska, they they could have been crowned champions. Yeah, and not if Michigan won. Because no, they had that right. one loss because That's they lost to Florida. The, the Peyton Manning never beat him. Florida. But, but you know, that it wasn't outside of the realm of possibility of no, I mean, they, losing. Yeah, they were number three. Yeah. I mean, they you know, you get Michigan beat and you beat Nebraska, then, you know. And they, they didn't have a chance in that game. They, I mean, they just got yeah. thoroughly whipped. So, in the AP, Michigan won with 52 number one votes to Nebraska's 18. Now, Michigan beat six top 25 teams, including five that were ranked in the top 15. Nebraska beat four top 25 teams with only three being in the top 15. And the, the reason that all this happened, Nebraska was number one for a while, like several weeks. And this was the year that Nebraska quarterback Scott Frost, who's now the head coach at UCF, he threw the pass in the Missouri end zone that got kicked up in the air and was caught by Matt Davison. You remember that? Yes. It's called the flea kicker game. That play sent Nebraska and Missouri into overtime. Nebraska ended up winning 45-38 to 38 at Missouri. The next week, Michigan took over both polls as number one. And Nebraska dropped from number one all the way back to number three and never got number one back until the very end of the season in the coaches' poll. Now, like we said, this is one year before the BCS was implemented. And that lasted 98 to like 2014. Can you believe that every high school player that's being recruited right now has never seen a college football season that did not end with the number one ranked team playing with the number two ranked team at the end of the year? Like, you remember when we were kids, that was a oh, common thing. Oh, I'm going I'm to stop you there. I'm going to stop you there. Because there's been a couple of BCS National Championship games. Yes, but as far as it, multiple a ranking. rankings. Multiple rankings. Just the BCS had them one and two. But the coaches poll and the AP poll had it differently. Right. So, Auburn, 2003. Auburn should have got in over Oklahoma. That one was AP and coaches number all, one and number two. All day long. Well, here's the thing. Oklahoma went undefeated, too. That's right. And and they blasted everybody on their schedule. So like that, yeah. It, saying that Auburn should have gotten in is is in. that's all looking at revisionist history. It's not. It's not live. When that happened, everybody knew Oklahoma beat up a mediocre Big Twelve, and Auburn just ran through the gauntlet of the SEC. We didn't just start getting no, good I, at football the last couple I agree. Of years. All right, I agree. And. Auburn, they, they had to beat Auburn the defending was, national champions in LSU. Worlds, yes. Auburn's was worlds better than Oklahoma. And yeah. Oklahoma did not belong in that game. No, Oklahoma and they and it showed, showed. In every national championship game they've played in, except for recent history, that they didn't. They don't belong. Yeah. When they get thrown into the playoffs, when they get thrown that's, into these that's national why they call them big games, game Bob. That's right. They just <laughs> they don't belong. He got one big national championship win run with Barry Switzer's crew, and after that, he never made another one that was impressive at all. Yeah. Did not deserve it. And then the year LSU played Oklahoma could have easily been LSU USC. and USC. Yeah, probably should have been USC. That's the and last... And realistically, not, not being an LSU homer here, it could have been Oklahoma and USC, and LSU got left out. All three of those teams were pretty much in the mix. But if you wanted to look at really break it down those years it was screwy oklahoma, computer rankings oklahoma got in two years that they didn't deserve to when the when the results came out to find out that yeah these computer and it's because they they played weaker opponents and they got to blow them out yeah and, and, it, computer, and it made it look good because right. the writers yes. you know ranked them up there that's and right. and their wins were totally just it, it it was uh it was just a show it was yeah. You know. Well, and so so you talked about kids not really seeing one champion, okay? 
Because I, I make fun of Alabama for having 37 national championships or 52 or however many y'all claim. Because all you need is some newspaper at back in the day to say, well, they were the best. And there were years where y'all had two or three losses and Notre Dame went undefeated and Alabama's claimed national championship. And, and it's the, not just a Bama thing. Because yeah, that's Nebraska, everybody. No, not everybody. No, no, no. It was all the big schools that were on national TV at right, the time. Right. Don't don't say everybody got treated the same. <laughs> no, I'm you saying and Notre Dame and Nebraska and USC and like those schools and got I know what you're saying. differently. I know what you're saying. I completely agree with you. Like so, the yeah. 16 number is is bananas. There are 11 legitimate national mm, champions. Hey, okay. Go I, back I would, and look. I'm being I would for real. Absolutely challenge you on that. That's not it. even knowing them off the top of my head. I'm telling you there are 11 legitimate national We're champions. We're not doing this on the radio. But uh, but uh, here's the thing though. Like that it, <laughs> I forget where in the hell we were talking. What are we, we were talking, talking about? We talking about how kids today have never seen like they didn't have to deal with this. Well, no, here's the, here's the, here's what they don't have to deal with. They don't have to deal with number 1 Michigan who has been like undefeated number 1 all year. And getting also, stuck in the Rose Bowl playing number eight Washington State. Yes. No, even as even as a, as a freshman in high school back in the day, I never liked, I still to this day do not like conference tie-ins to, to bowl, bowl games. games. And I now don't, you don't have to worry about it. I don't well, no, you, you know, still do. It, it, you only still a do. little bit. No, 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 the, the fact that it's only a little bit, it doesn't matter. It's still one of the big games. That is supposed to matter, and you have a team that's not deserving to get it because they won their conference, and their conference is used to playing here. That's still a problem. Yeah, yeah. The I Big mean, I, Twelve gets the Sugar Bowl bid a lot. They there are times where the Big Twelve championship just does not deserve it. Yeah, I agree with that. They don't like. There was no reason for Oklahoma to get in there two years ago, really. Yeah. Now last year they earned every bit of it, and they beat the hell out of Auburn. Yeah, but there are times where they just don't. There, there have been times when the ACC winner did not deserve to go to the Orange Bowl. They just, they just weren't that good. The Big Twelve winner, or Big Ten winner, same thing. Shouldn't be going to the Rose Bowl. Yeah, yeah. So, I, man, the whole thing's. Nuts. I don't like conference tie-ins to big bowl games that bring large sums of money, way more than the rest of the bowls, and. Um, a major prestige in rankings of how final rankings come out. It doesn't affect the national champion, but it still matters. Yeah. You could be the eighth or ninth best team in the country, but if you win the Rose Bowl, you still won the Rose Bowl. Well, there was probably a number four team in the country that, you know, won the Fiesta Bowl that would much rather have a Rose Bowl win than a Fiesta Bowl win. That's true. That's that's my problem. Yeah. The prestige of one is only going to go to one of two conferences. Yeah. But it's supposedly the granddaddy of them all. That's dumb. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. All right, so according to... I can't believe we're in this. According to the... And it's only going to be a minute. Go ahead. But... Make your case. There were seven that are undisputed, right? In 1926... Seven's a whole lot better than 11. Go ahead. Yes. In 1926, they tied Stanford 7-7 seven to seven in the Rose Bowl and completed a 9 0 and one season. That sounds like an awful game. That's what I'm saying. Uh, six different uh, publications awarded the national title to Alabama. Four other ones awarded Stanford. Because Stanford was also undefeated except for the tie. Yeah. To add to the confusion, Navy, Michigan, and Lafayette also claimed titles that year. That's right. Uh, so in this, 19, is, yeah. this is, this is going to be an example of what younger kids never had to deal with and unless they look back on history. Why were there four national champions in the 60s? In 1926 or whatever, yeah. 1930, defeated Washington State 24 to nothing in the Rose Bowl, completed a 10-0 season. Four entities awarded the national title to Alabama. Another eight favored 10-0 Notre Dame. Yes. And the tiebreaker will always go to Notre Dame No, in a situation like that, especially back then. The NCAA recognizes them. I get it. Yeah, yeah. the NCAA recognizes uh, Notre Dame as that. Um, 1934, defeated Sanford 29-13 in the Rose Bowl. Went ten and zero. Five different entities awarded the national title to Alabama. Eight other ones favored eight and zero Minnesota. The NCAA recognizes Minnesota. It, you know, it it was all based on bias back then. That's right. So 1941 defeated Texas A&M 29-21 in the Cotton Bowl. Completed a nine and two season. The Holgate system chose the tie as champion. The NCAA recognizes Minnesota eight and zero as champion. As did eleven entities that season. 
Texas was the choice of two other organizations. That one we can wipe out. 41, get it out of here. 1964, lost to Texas 24-17 to in the Orange Bowl to complete 10-1. Four entities. Uh, like this whole thing. We're going to do this 26? No, no, no. We just, we're we're going to knock out these other however many. Okay. Uh, this was 64. They lost to Texas. Uh, so we won't count that one. Yeah. Get that. I think, out I think I made my point. I think what you've done. But, here, but here's the thing: Arkansas feel stronger about this than I've ever felt. Arkansas, Notre Dame, and Alabama, and Michigan all claimed national championships in 1964. Yes, yes. I knew that there was times in the 60s where like four to five people all won national championships in the same year. Yeah. 1965 defeated Nebraska 39 to 28 in the Orange Bowl. Four entities awarded the national title to Alabama. Another 12 favored Michigan State. The NCAA recognizes them as co-champions in 65. I think of everything before the BCS, if you wipe out and say, we're not calling anybody, nobody can count that a champion. Because all these are newspapers. Yeah. All these are, you just needed a big enough newspaper to recognize you. Exactly. That's it. So everything after that, you're still the most dominant program in the country. Yeah. You're probably more dominant if you only start counting the BCS wins and nothing behind that than any than any program than you are right now counting all you know 82 of the ones you got yeah no i'm i'm with you so i think, the, I think the percentage way, wise that's better numbers wise the way that it and those are legit I'm, I'm not gonna here we go any of those. it's 10 like so if you just count ap alabama has won 10 national titles yeah and the AP is the most respected and the associated press. Notre Dame's got eight, but they Oklahoma did give you seven. from the 64 season. I'll yeah. knock that out. So, 64, 65, to, you know, whatever. Any of those seasons where three or four people won it, nobody, yeah, nobody, just, nobody gets that. Nobody claims, or nobody should anyway. Yeah. So, can you believe Can you believe George has only won one? That doesn't surprise me. Texas A&M's only won one. It's really hard to win national championships. Oh, hell yeah, it is. Like, it's, it's really, really hard. I... I think we live in a world where people at the big programs just expect it so much, but it's hard. It's really, really hard. Oh, it's insanely difficult. Insanely there are difficult. tons of programs that are great at football that have never won any. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. All right, let's let's uh, let's wrap this thing up. Let's do a little rapid fire. The Patriots sent out AFC Championship game tickets with their season ticket orders. Love Is it. that too cocky? No. Or does it even really matter? I love it. I absolutely. <laughs> well, That's of course you do. You're a Patriots but fan. I, but I. All right, so. But nor- I think you got the right to do it no, right now. Normally, I would be very like, "Oh, that's bad karma." I don't. You might look at me come November and just laugh at me because I'm so. This is just our comeuppance. But I think there's this just team is ready to go. Yeah. They're ready, and they're saying, "Look, if you buy season tickets." You get every home playoff game, and you get the AFC Championship game. We're throwing it all in there because we're going to be playing them right here at Foxborough. Oh, yeah. And we're playing all of them here at Foxborough. Hey, you, you know what the odds are for them to win the AFC East? Oh, I, oh now that now that Tannehill's gone down, I bet they've gone up today. I, I don't even know if it went up today. It's, it's minus 2,500. Oh, I'll bet. That didn't surprise me. Before the season started, it was only like minus 450 or something the, like that. The like, next like biggest? You bet it back in – May or March, something like that. Yeah. April, you could have got it at like minus four fifty, and I don't know why. I don't think it was minus four fifty. I, I mean, God, y'all have won it every year for what, like twelve straight years? Yeah, it, that's not changing. No, I don't think that, it is. Either. That's not changing. Like, but like, I, I think it's probably been close to twenty five hundred for a while. The next closest one out of all the divisions in football was the Steelers at minus three sixty. Yeah. To win the AFC North. Yeah. And Flacco's got a broken back. Hey, you know who's favored in the AFC South? Titans. The Tennessee Titans. I don't like that. They're, they're at plus 110. I don't like that. But everybody's a plus in the South because nobody knows what that's the That's it. The next closest one, I think, is uh, the Houston, Houston Texans at plus 145. I liked it better when they weren't getting disrespect. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, all right, you brought up Tannehill. Tannehill went down with a knee injury at Dolphins camp today. Now, did you see this? I there saw- was a doctor that tweeted, and I love this. There was a doctor down there, like Dr. Parikh, I think. He tweeted out, just by looking at the video, it looks like he's going to come back with an ACL tear. Yeah, and it was like a sprained knee. And then it comes, you know, the thing comes back about an hour later, maybe not even that long, and they're like, uh, No structural damage. No structural damage. He's going to be fine, just got to rest it, whatever. There was another guy that tweeted right after that and was like, Dr. Parikh, I'm sorry, i got to cancel my appointment with you. Yeah, like... (laughs) 
Like this dude's like, what? Is he a proctologist just sitting at home watching watching? Uh, who knows? Football? What are you doing? Yeah, you got me. Like, uh, what, why even put yourself out on a limb there? What an idiot! Because you can't see anything you from. You're watching TV. Oh what God! Are you doing? Yeah, it's just ridiculous. All right, uh, talking about injuries, the Ravens are in training camp. They have had a massive injury basically every day, right? So only one starter practiced on the line Thursday, mm-hmm. and that was the left guard. Flacco's out at quarterback. There were 19 total players that missed, uh, that missed practice on Thursday. What do you think is going on with the Ravens? They are. Every year are they getting seems, old? No, I think they are getting old. But I also think that every year there seems to be one team that just gets decimated. decimated I knew you were going to say that word. <laughs> before the season starts. And, and they just happen to be that team. I, I, the first thing I did was like, are we going to talk about them bringing body bags to Baltimore? Because that's what they're doing every day. It's just, just like trainers are getting more of a workout than the players are. Yeah. Yeah, so. I agree. That's It's ridiculous. All right, look, that's going to wrap it up for this episode of Winning Cures Everything. You guys know what to do. WinningCuresEverything.com. Go to the website. Share it out. Tell all your buddies about it. It's been a really big week for us. Really big week so far. Uh, like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash winning cures everything. You can follow us on Twitter at winning cures. You can follow myself at Gary WCE. You can follow me at Chris B G N N E C H R I S B G I A N N I N I. You can also email the show winning cures everything at gmail.com. You can download, subscribe to, and review the podcast. iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play. Let, we're going to go on and toss this out there. For every 25 reviews that we get on iTunes, five star with a sentence or two reviewing the show, we're going to donate $25 to St. Jude or Le Bonner. Le Bonner, either one. But what those two will go back and forth yeah. on. Those are every space uh, children's hospitals for anybody that doesn't know. Um, St. Jude is known around the world for working with children's cancer um, and, and making you know, massive uh, industrialized changes yeah. to, the, to the cancer treatments. And then Le is just a great children's hospital. I actually have uh, nephews that have spent a lot more time than I wish they ever did in Le that's, I've so got that's, friends that's, that actually spent time really, in St. Jude. That's really special to me, so yeah. I wanted to throw them in there. Absolutely. So every 25 reviews that we get, Chris and I are going to toss 25 bucks to a charity. So review us on iTunes. Five stars and put a little sentence about it. Knock it out. Help us out. Because they don't get those, the donations. It's your fault. <laughs> the, the reviews help out a whole lot. So, knock those things out. You can also get us on Local X Radio. That's localxradio.com or the Local X app on your smartphone every Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. So, we want to thank Tim Brando and Chris Felica for jumping in here with us and making this, honestly, my all-time favorite show that we've done. So great. It's not every day we get guys of that stature in here. They're two of the best in the biz. And we look forward to bringing them and more guests like them to our show. So for Chris Giannini, I'm Gary Seegers. This is the Winning Cures Everything podcast. Until next week. Have a good one, guys. Happy birthday, Tom. Hey, this is Gary Seegers, host of The Stage View. Make sure and tune in to Local X's first morning sports show, Winning Cures Everything, with myself and Chris Giannini every Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. Check out the site and grab the podcast at winningcureseverything.com.